This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 846, recorded on December 21st, 2021. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. Here on the shortest day of the year, it's 38 degrees Fahrenheit, 4 degrees Celsius. And from here on, for six months, the days get longer. All right. Can't wait. And warmer, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> also joining us from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi, everybody. Uh, we got... It says, hang on, 65 degrees uh, and sunny. It's all good. From Madison, New Jersey, Brianne Barker. Hi. Uh, It's 41 and very cloudy here, Um, but it will soon be out from under the uh, cloud of grades, so that will be nice. It's 5 degrees Celsius and cloudy here. And from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. And it's um, it's pretty similar here. It's cloudy, 41, um, and we're dreaming of a wintry mix Christmas. Is that how that song goes? Mix. <laughs> so today, the 20th, is today the first day of winter? Is that right? Uh, well, yeah, yeah. It's, the, it's the solstice, which is the point where the earth is tilted so that we get the shortest day. Some people it's call the shortest that, day, yeah, yeah. Some people call that the first day of winter. Some people call it midwinter, but then February okay. is much colder. Because so. I, I know on the 21st of November, I saw people proclaiming welcome to winter, but I, yeah. I don't know. No, I think today is the sort of official day. And according to Shortest stores, day. the day after Thanksgiving is when Christmas begins. So, <laughs> Well, New York is a mess right now. It's just crowded as anything. And this, I, I go to Penn Station and it's just full of people with suitcases because they're going somewhere. I mean, this has been like this since Thanksgiving. People have been traveling. So uh, I um, look forward to it quieting down a bit. So this would be so the last two for the last two weeks of 2021, um, we'll just do two twivs a week, the, the, our normal twiv, and then our clinical update. We're not going to record on the next two Fridays, Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve. Although this episode will release on the usual Sunday. For those of you who are fixed on a Sunday morning release, you'll get it. <laughs> but I thought we'd take a, a little bit of time off for the rest of the year. And um, the the first episode of 2021, 22, we'll do a, a wrap up of 2021. It's easy, COVID. Yeah, that's pretty much <laughs> what happened in 2021. Although we've had a lot of cool guests. Uh, I'd love to highlight some of those, but we'll, we'll work on that later. And we have some good guests coming up in January. We have, get this, Alessandro Sette, John Udell. John Mascola. Ooh, I hadn't noticed that one on the schedule. I saw the other two and was excited. Yeah. John is the director of the Vaccine Research Center. And he keeps sending me emails when I say something wrong and he wants to correct me. And uh, nice, he's very nice about now it. Now he though. can have a whole episode of it. He says, I'm just concerned about my favorite podcaster's health. <laughs> That's good. I like it when it's that way. Um, anyway, that should be fun. And I have some others in the works. So... Uh, It'll be it'll be interesting, and of course, uh, as always, for the this last month of the year, and um, for January, if you make a contribution to Parasites Without Borders, it'll be not only federal U.S. tax free, but they'll double your contribution, give it back to Microbe TV, and of course, we are also a five hundred one c three, and Microbe TV Inc. is a new company, which is the five hundred one c three, the old company the. Uh, it was Microbe TV LLC, and that is going to be eventually abandoned. And it's Microbe being absorbed TV, into Microbe TV Inc. Yeah, but well, we're going to abandon it, so I don't have to file stuff the in New employees Jersey. Employees have the time. to be retrained, but other than that, everybody's <laughs> the LLC on. is a New Jersey corporation, and I have to file stuff every year, and I don't want to do it because we're not using it. So at some point, we'll. It's called abandoning. Ah, but of course, all the assets will be transferred. But anyway, Microbe TV Inc. is a New York corporation. And um, 
it was established on April 11th, 2020. So anyone donating since then, your, your donations are U.S. federal tax deductible from that date. So but 2020 is too late because you already filed your taxes. But for all of 2021, your donations are tax deductible. That's the law. It goes back to when you first started the 501c3. Okay, I've gotten lots of emails about that and confirming it. So thank you. And so you could donate to either uh, Daniel or us. And many of you have decided to take up on the offer of $1,000 donation or more. By the end of 2021, I'll send you an autographed copy of Principles Virology. I think like 20 people have done that. It's great. Nice. Wow. That's cool. I didn't think anyone would care and just go buy it for <laughs> 150 bucks, but I appreciate it. We appreciate it. So you still have time to do that. You won't get it by the holidays because I went to the post office yesterday to mail one and the line was around the corner. <laughs> I don't want to wait on that line. So you need to get uh, the USPS click and ship. And you just have to drop it off, no? Uh, yeah, I guess. Or if you meet your mailman, they can take it from you. You think if I put it in the mailbox, it won't well, fit? Well, if it's over 17 ounces, no, yeah, it's, that's 13, no 13 oh, ounces. Yeah. I do print my own labels and you know box mm. them, and I just yeah. drop them off at the post office. But now that there's a line, I really can't go all the way inside and do that. So. I'll figure something out, but you'll get them in the early weeks of, of next year. All right. Um, so that is that. And now we have two, uh, two papers for you. And we are continuing to try and mix it up, uh, one COVID and one non-COVID. So first, a cell host and microbe paper. And the subtitle is called Clinical and Translational Report. I haven't noticed these subtitles. Has anyone else? Uh, occasionally, uh, you know, it's like, <sighs> it's like I think of toothpaste in the grocery store. All right. There's not just toothpaste uh, from any given manufacturer. Fire control plus whitening. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> there are a zillion different kinds. Okay. And, and once this gets started, Gross everybody's got to compete crystals, by yeah. having all of their different types uh okay. and yes. I, I saw i saw an article some time ago about how uh there was a um an epidemic of depression in the u.s and attributed it to that there were too many choices and <laughs> i get it you know i just look at the toothpaste dial and i get depressed with so much to choose from you'd think you'd have a choice yeah it's true when you want to Buy something, yeah, it's often there are a lot of choices. But, I mean, if you go to buy bleach, there's usually just one or two choices. <laughs> well, this is why Trader Joe's is a tenth the size of any other store. That's and right. easy to shop at because they yeah. make the choice for you. Did you hear the Freakonomics series about that? No. no. Oh, yeah, it was good. Uh, because, you know, they don't use coupons. They don't advertise. They only have one brand of everything. And, and it's pretty presented to like a business class or something as a case, you know, could this company survive? And everybody says, no. And then, <laughs> then they tell them, oh, it's Trader Joe's. <laughs> yeah. It's a good store. My daughter has been working for them for, for quite a while and um, it's, it's well run. Yeah. yeah it's well, good. The, the trick is the one brand, the one kind of everything they pick is the yeah. delicious kind. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. There's a, there's a also, whole, actually there's a whole section on, in a book I picked several months ago, um, the Secret Life of Groceries about Trader Joe's. That's right, I remember that, yeah. And how they operate, and yeah. why they operate that way. It's, yeah. I mean, but there are some things that they have choice, like they have a lot of different wines and beers That's, and yeah. that sort of thing, right? <clears throat> so there's not just one kind of wine, because that wouldn't work. <laughs> that wouldn't work. <laughs> but uh, I went to, right down the street from the studio is a Whole Foods, and I went to get some yogurt uh, yesterday, and... If you don't know what you like, man, that's like there's 5,000 different kinds of yogurt. Yeah. And they're diversifying all the time with all different ingredients and this and that. So I like, what is it, Siggy or Sigil or something like that? S-I-G-G-I. -I -I. And I just bought a big, they sell them in big containers. So mm -hmm. you can, of course, here at the incubator, I don't have any bowls. So that was a problem. But <laughs> I think this ought to be flagged as one of the better TWIV digressions. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. no, it's not your fault. I, I started sorry. it. We just like chatting, frankly. Well, <laughs> and Rich, I'm pretty sure that my friends who are psychology professors have also told me about the exact phenomenon you're mentioning. So. Right. 
It's, a, it's interesting, the, the grocery uh, strategy, right? Yeah. It's a thing. Yeah. So yeah. I, mm -hmm. I appreciate it. Secret appreciate Life of it. Groceries, read it. It's a whole insight into that. All right, so this paper, which Clinical and Translational Report started this off, um, it's called Enteric Virome Negatively Affects Seroconversion Following Oral Rotavirus Vaccination in a Longitudinally Sampled Cohort of Ghanaian Infants. Is that right, Ghanaian? Or That's Ghanaian. how I've heard it. A Ghanaian is how I've heard it. Ghanaian. Um, I don't think negatively affects is correct. I think it would be as negatively associated with because they haven't yes. proven cause right. and effect, yes. right? Yep. Anyway, uh, I think there's one first author, Andrew Hu Jin Kim, and then there are then there's one uh, corresponding author, Vanessa Harris. And they're from Washington University, University of Ghana, and Amsterdam University. And this is a, an interesting topic, which actually, um, it, the reason it stood out this week is because of Paul Offit, because he was uh, involved in development of rotavirus vaccines, right? Rotavirus, leading cause of uh, diarrhea mortality among children all over the world, and more deaths in um Sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia. There are attenuated vaccines, uh, and Paul mentioned a couple of those uh, the other day, and they have been really instrumental at decreasing deaths, but they have uh, low performance in LMICs, low- and middle-income countries. They don't protect infants as well in those countries as they do in HICs. <laughs> High-income High income countries, countries. Yes. <clears throat> um, I, I have a feeling that those are not the right words, right? Because rich versus poor was too uh, blunt. Well, that's no, and then developed and non-developed wasn't yeah, good either, that's right? Yeah, sort of, that's sort of prejudicial as well, in a So low-income and high-income, that's probably more neutral, right? Yeah. I, okay. I mean, that is generally the neutral thing people use. Yeah. All right. Um, vaccine effectiveness in high-income countries, typically 84 to 90%. Uh, low income, forty-five to fifty-seven percent. That to me is just all by itself. You know, quit right there. That's striking. Yes, mm -hmm. and and it makes a good point, which is why you need the test vaccines in different countries because obviously there are differences. Uh, and also, uh, why when something uh, some uh, SARS thing pops up in some other country, you shouldn't immediately assume it's going to behave the same in your country. Right, and so this is especially true with a live attenuated vaccine because you're depending on the host replicating the virus and that's going to vary from place to place. And this paper yeah. actually indicates one of the reasons that might be the case. They, they estimate that if you could improve the uh, effectiveness 15%, that would leave, save 400,000 lives in the next 20 years. And so I wonder this, how much of that is also related to um, the amount of rotavirus circulation in both places. Um, although I think it's hard to separate that from the vaccine effectiveness because if the vaccine is less effective, you're going to have more circulation. And so I don't know that those are um, separable, but I do wonder if there are differences in the rotavirus burden in different places. Well, Kathy, you're on mute. <laughs> Yeah, you still I wanted to one. digress. Just okay. took me that long to get there with Zencaster. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, I wanted to digress just a bit um, and just talk a little about rotavirus because I think we haven't done that much lately. It's a non-enveloped, double-stranded RNA virus. It's interesting because it has a triple capsid and it has 11 segments for its double-stranded RNA genome. It can encode 12 proteins. And it never completely uncoats during its replication cycle um, because otherwise it would reveal its double-stranded RNA and there would be all kinds of antiviral responses to that. So, rotavirus. Thank you. So, why, why does the vaccine not work as well in these areas? It's important to sort out, right? And there are a lot of people interested, a lot of risk factors that they identify, maternal antibodies, blood group antigens, malnutrition. None of those have panned out. Um, there are often um, 
emphasizing the country differences, often there will be something that looks like a strong correlation in one place, and then somebody does the study in another very similar income level country and finds the correlation doesn't hold. Of course, the microbiome is a candidate because these are orally administered vaccines that reproduce in the intestine. And so the bacteria there could certainly influence, but they say there's been no consistent correlation between immunogenicity of the vaccines and the, the microbiota. So we're still left puzzled with that. So this paper, they look at... Um, they look at things that other things in the intestines, namely the uh, the virome, the eukaryotic viruses and the bacteriophages, and uh, see if there's any correlation with that. And they they have a very interesting. So this is from a the data are, are part of a trial of Rotorix, which is an attenuated, uh, orally administered rotavirus vaccine, and this was from a uh, trial done in Ghana. And for that trial, they collected fecal samples along with serum to look at uh, immune responses. So they're in a great position to uh, look at this by doing sequencing. It's a phase four randomized clinical trial in rural Ghana um, from infants who had received the vaccine, different dosing schedules. Um, and so three-dose Rotorix, uh, they had 122 um, of the 143 infants with fecal samples uh, were were available, and they used them for this study. In total, 460 fecal samples at different doses: dose one six weeks, dose two ten weeks, and dose three 14 weeks uh, after the vaccine. So it's kind of useful to be able to look at that and then correlate that with seroconversion at those different times. It's a good opportunity. So first, they do. Um, 16S ribosomal RNA sequencing. So you extract. Uh, 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 I just want to say how many seroconverted. Were you going to get there? Go ahead. You can, you can ask that. The, so 100 and, 122 patients, 51 seroconverted. They're measuring uh, yeah. serum IgA, which yeah. is a right, mucosal right. antibody, which is appropriate for this. Uh, it's appropriate to immunize with a live attenuated oral vaccine because it's uh, this is a gut infection. It's appropriate to look for IgA because that's uh, mucosal antibody, which is you know at the gut uh, barrier to infection. So uh, of the 122, 42 percent seroconverted. I'm sorry. Yes, 42 percent. That is 51 individuals yeah. um, seroconverted. 58 percent. Did not uh, seventy one uh, patients did not seroconvert. Uh, here again, that was similar to the numbers we were talking about. Even worse at the top of the show. So that's a forty two percent seroconversion in this case. That's uh, astonishing. And and they define seroconversion um, based on those antibody titers at eighteen weeks. Um, and so I think that's sort of interesting that it they they wait a while um, right. to allow that seroconversion to right. happen. It's not immediate. And uh, th this doesn't just mean uh, it's a crummy vaccine because the same vaccine in the U.S. would have, I don't know what the numbers are, but a much higher uh, seroconversion. I think it's over 80%, but something just like off that. the top mm -hmm. of my head. <clears throat> so they take their fecal samples, they extract DNA, and then they sequence, they determine the sequence of a specific region of the bacterial ribosomal RNA gene, the 16S uh, which is a bacterial ribosomal a RNA subunit in a specific region of that, which will allow them to determine what kind of bacteria are there. And this is a but very standard thing. It's kind of yeah. the, the thing you go to when you do a study of the bacterium of whatever, because yeah. um, 16S is highly conserved enough that you can get the primers in there and you can you know all the bacteria have it, but it varies enough that you can identify species groups. Yeah, basically the primers go to the conserved region um, and there's a variable region in between um, the conserved regions. Yeah. Um, and the other really nice thing about 16S is that it allows you to sort of compare um, between different studies because so many people do 16S. Yes. So at the phylum lever level, so you may be thinking, what are the phyla? <laughs> and these, since this is a virus podcast, you haven't heard this much. We have actinobacteria, Bacteriodetes, firmicutes, and proteobacteria. And these are phyla which contain below them families of bacteria. Uh, and we talk about these on 
twim this week in microbiology all the time. But no differences at that level. It's a pretty high level, right? Yeah. So if you would yeah. see a difference at that level, that would be a big deal. Yeah. So those are basically, I think of as the big four phyla um, in uh, the domain bacteria. Um, it, they contain something like 90 plus percentage of all um, members of domain bacteria. Um, and so most of the things that you've thought of are there. Sometimes um, I think that in some um, microbiome studies where, you know, if you get, uh, you know, some microbiome work done, sometimes you'll, you will see a bacterioides firmicutes um, shift. Um, but that's really the main thing that, oh, and, and usually you see very few proteobacteria, but that's the only sort of big picture difference that you tend to see with these guys. Yeah, a phylum, phylum level classification, we're chordates. I mean, that's how high level this is. So yeah. everything with a spinal cord is in one phylum. <laughs> um, so if you think of firmicutes, well, that's one phylum. That's like chordates. Do they have backbones, those guys? No, uh, no. Uh, <laughs> firmicutes do not have backbones. Very, very tiny backbones. <laughs> so if you then go, go lower, below phyla, then you can look at taxa. Um, and they find, they find, do find some variation in, in, which they call amplicon sequence variants or ASVs. So now every time I read this, yeah. I thought of our ASVs. society. <laughs> yeah, and there's a, there's a little weirdness <laughs> that shows up with these types of studies where they don't refer a lot to species because mm -hmm. there's a whole lot of fluidity to that, especially yeah. in yeah. bacteria. Right. And so you get these taxonomic groups, these taxa, which, you know, kingdom, phylum, class, where does taxa fit? Well, that's just groups it's okay yeah. we defined these and they'll have parameters the sequence, for, yeah. for defining the sequence so they find some differences associated with seroconversion at the different doses so and here's where it gets crazy because there's an unclassified taxon within the uh, enterobacteriaceae a family that seems dose one associated with seroconversion but we don't even know <laughs> what it is and then at dose two they have other taxa, Streptococcus and a Lactobacillus um, taxa, and then and then some which are negatively associated. Um, they it, have another taxa associated with IgA titers, which is quite interesting. For 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 the aficionados, um, Enterobacteriaceae are gram negatives that are related that include things like E. coli, um, Vibrio, Proteus, Yersinia. Um, sort of all of those uh, organisms. And so an unclassified taxon within that uh, is kind of interesting. Yeah. Yeah, and they, in the process of taking these time points, as these kids are getting these these vaccine doses, they're also, of course, they're infants and they're getting older. And yeah. there are yep. changes associated with them getting older to their, to their microbiome. So that's going on too, and that shows up in the data. Of course, if you did this in another country, you'd find different. You'd things, find different likely. stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, these are all quite different. But anyway, they conclude we, you know, the overall course specific taxa belonging to the orders Enterobacteriales and Lactobacillales and the Actinobacteria phylum are consistently or periodically associated with seroconversion, as we just discussed for these taxa. But I would say these are not stunning, right? And they're just associations. We have no idea. Um, really, if it's causation or not. And and as I said, if you did it elsewhere, it would be different, which would be then hard. You, you're not going to be able to deal with this on a country-by-country -country basis, right? So then they would look at viruses. And first they looked at bacteriophages. And here they, they um, isolate virus-like particles from the stool samples. So they isolate particles and then um, isolate a DNA and RNA and do... Shotgun sequencing. Now, in this so case, there's, there's nothing analogous to 16S no. in viruses. So you just so, <clears throat> sequence everything. You have to sequence a lot, yeah. And so you end up getting lots, large fractions of genomes as a, con as a consequence. And they did both. They looked for both <laughs> RNA genomes and yeah. DNA genomes, yes. which I really appreciated because most, uh, a lot of studies look at one or the other. And they did both. And they find the usual suspect phages that are found um, in, in the gut, which, because their hosts are there, of course, caudovirales, um, which, Kevin Spacey. which 
of which there are families Ackerman viridi, Myoviridae, Podoviridae, and Siphoviridae, some Microviridae as well. Uh, these don't mean a lot to you, but they're just very common uh, families of bacteriophages. Uh, but then they use various um, statistical approaches to calculate the richness and diversity, right? The richness and diversity, two different, diversity, the all different kinds. Can you someone remember, remind me, what's the richness? I forgot. There's a specific definition of richness. Right. Is, well, and alpha diversity is composed of richness and Shannon diversity. Right. And then Shannon diversity uh, is really complicated mathematically, but there was a good explanation of it in Wikipedia that I liked. What exactly? Let's see. Richness. Ah. <sighs> While you're figuring that out, I'll tell you what Shannon diversity is. They okay. say it, um, you could think of it as how it relates to uh, Shannon inter information content in strings of text. The idea is that the more letters there are and the closer their proportional abundances in the string of interest, the more difficult it is to correctly predict which letter will be the next one in the string. And then it's uh, uh, this natural logarithm and da, 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 da. it's a really complicated formula mathematically, but I like that description of what Shannon diversity is. So well, richness is the number of genomes that match at least one sequence in the metagenome. Yeah. So, so basically richness is the number of different um, members of a community and yeah. Diversity actually counts both the number and abundance and of abundance. them. <clears throat> so what they found is that samples from non-converters had significantly increased richness and Shannon diversity, most strikingly at dose one when compared with zero converters. Um, so a unique phageome at dose one associates with lack of zero conversion to the to the uh, vaccine. I remember the phageome is a reflection of the bacteriome, right? The right. phages need to grow on bacteria. So presumably there are some differences there that we're not seeing. And as kids age, remember, we did this a long time ago. I think it was a study out of Michigan with the kids of virome, Kathy, the yes. age -ome changing as the kids get older. Baby's first virome was the episode. Well, that was not Michigan. That's Ephraim Lim. Uh, he was at Wash U then. Then it was somebody from your lab, maybe a firm, yeah. former person. Ephraim yeah. Lim was the undergrad, former undergraduate. Got it. In my okay. Lab. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's the Michigan connection. So as they age, the microbiome changes, and so does the phage ohm as well. And so these are pretty young kids, and this is a dynamic situation. So in this anyway, case, so the right the the correlation was greater phage diversity was lower seroconversion. Did I get that right? No. So the, there is. Increased richness and diversity at dose one, which uh, correlates with um, non being a non-converter. So right. more more phage diversity and riches, you're more likely more, to be a non-converter. More diversity, yeah. less seroconversion. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what that means. They're getting rid of certain bacterial hosts yeah. because the phages themselves are not themselves influencing seroconversion. They must be doing so by the modulation of the bacteria. Uh, microbiome, right? right? And the the microbiomes um, at the bacterial level didn't look radically different. So it's not like yeah. the phage population is causing huge changes in the in the yeah. microbiome, but somehow having more types of phages in your gut is making you less likely, or, or it correlates yeah. with lower rate of seroconversion. So then they looked at the eukaryotic virome, found seven dominant viral families. And now in contrast, these are going to just flow off my tongue, right? <laughs> <laughs> the cornoviridae, parvoviridae, rioviridae, astroviridae, aneloviridae, adenoviridae, and caliciviridae. <laughs> Both DNA and RNA. It hangs all here. Virus <laughs> in there. And of course, the rioviridae is the family in which the rotaviruses are, are located. And they're um, both uh, single-stranded and double-stranded for RNA and DNA yeah. viruses, but it's not all seven of the Baltimore classification. 
Yeah. Right. No retroviruses. There's no right. retros and no, no hepadness. Uh, hep hepadness no. Yeah. And the most abundant reeds were from the Picornavir day. Impressive. But not surprising, um, right? Uh, they're quite diverse, yeah. They're diverse, and there are a lot of enteroviruses in there. Yeah, so. yeah. Um, no significant difference in the number of viral taxa detected between converters and non-converters at any dose. Okay, so that's that's really the overall finding. And then um, Rioviridae reads and Astroviridae reads increased over time. Uh, while abundance of reeds of other families remain the same. Um, I don't know what, what, what that means right now. I haven't gotten to the rest of it yet. Um, but um, no significant differences at the family level between non-converters and converters at all three doses. So, so far, we're not finding any differences, basically, between converters and non-converters. Um, there is an increase in non-vaccine Rioviridae over time, but I don't. There was no indication of what that meant with respect to seroconversion. However, um, they took a closer look at enteroviruses, um, and they they mentioned that enteroviruses, of course, which there are a lot of enteroviruses: poliovirus, Coxsackie's, Echoes. Uh, and then they're just uh, they're just given numbers. EV XX, more, more recent yeah. EV number, EV sixty eight, for example. They they're A B C D, and um, they're EVD sixty eight, for example. Um, and so previously, enteroviruses and and uh, OPV oral polio vaccine viruses have been implicated in limiting the efficacy of rotavirus vaccine. So they looked at these uh, more closely, and they can you know get a more granular look at the different enteroviruses, which include enterovirus, paracovirus, salivirus, cosavirus, enterovirus C, enterovirus B, et cetera. The Cs are poli include poliovirus, so the OPV uh, would be in there. These kids would have gotten OPV, so you would see some of the sequencing there. Um in general, they find the abundance of reads assigned to entro decreases over time, which would be the case for certainly entro C, because after you get the vaccine dose, it eventually stops reproducing in your gut. Um, at dose one, the detection of enterovirus B or cosavirus A was more frequent in samples from subjects that did not zero convert. And enterovirus B would include viruses, the echoviruses, which they were originally called years ago. It's such a quaint name, Echo, enteric cytopathic human orphan virus. Because <laughs> they got a virus out of the feces, which killed cells and culture and didn't seem to be associated with any disease. So that's where Echo comes from. But now they're just enterovirus B. And cosaviruses were more recently discovered uh, viruses. We did this paper a very long time ago on TWIV uh, from, I believe, the feces of kids in Pakistan, if I'm not mistaken. It's a brand new virus that's never been discovered before um, from someone in Lipkin's lab whose name is escaping me, and he's probably listening and getting mad at me that I forgot his name. Uh, Amit Kapoor, I think. Oh, maybe. Could be. Yeah. Anyway, that's what a COSO virus is. They're very, very understudied. We don't know really what they're doing, whether they're associated with disease or not. Um, so that's... They say that maybe these other viruses are competing uh, with um, rotavirus reproduction in some way, uh, which is limiting their efficacy. Because remember, the rotavirus vaccines have to reproduce in the gut in order to. Um, and you can imagine that it's not just at the level of getting into a cell, although it could be, but it could be generating some kind of immunity, which overlaps with the other virus, right? Um, then they looked at uh, correlations of viruses with IgA titers. I guess these are fecal IgA, right? That would make sense. Maybe not. Maybe they're serum. I don't remember. Anyway, significant correlations between IgA and parvoviruses and rheoviruses. Uh, positively correlating with uh, IgA titers. So higher levels of not only the vaccine, but 
Boca Parvo virus at early phases may enhance uh, rotavirus vaccine responses. So you're getting the idea that these are all very, very, um, we're reaching here, right? Yeah. <laughs> because these are all correlations, <laughs> but they have to start somewhere. And so they start here and then maybe this will lead to, uh, to something else. So I we think have all the IGA is serum. Serum IGA, okay. Yeah. And nevertheless, there's a correlation between IgA and parvoviridae and rioviridae. Positive correlation. And so who knows what that means? Um, they, they do note that some of these, they've found similar correlations in other infants, in Karachi, for example, um, uh, and also in other studies in the UK, Malawi, and India. So they are more generalizable. There is... There's another issue that leapt out at me when I was reading, reading the paper here. There's another correlation, which I don't see discussion of because they leap right into the whole uh, microbiome and virome thing. But in table one, um, the looking at the number of subjects and seroconverters versus non-seroconverters and how they separate into two groups, um, stunting, wasting, and underweight all very strongly correlate with non-zero converting. Um, now, I didn't do a statistical analysis to, to tell that. I'm just looking at the numbers. Uh, so, in the in the um, underweight group, uh, 25 percent of your zero converters are underweight. 75 percent of your non-zero converters are underweight for age. Um, and stunting and wasting, similar and malnutrition. Um, so it seems like maybe that's the underlying issue and these other, the, this phage diversity and such is stemming from that. I was assuming that they would discuss that at some point, it didn't, but, yeah, I, but yeah. I don't see it. Yeah. And, and there is definitely uh literature on, uh, microbiome changes, um, yeah. with all of these, uh, types of malnutrition. Yeah. And so, yeah, that, that leapt out to me as well. Um, in that, you know, as I looked at this, I got to exactly the point that Vincent was mentioning when we talked about the title of, um, you know, is, is everything that we're seeing here cause or effect? And are we really measuring sort of two sides of the same thing. Maybe you have something different about your immune system that both changes your microbiome and changes your ability to zero convert. Or maybe you have something different metabolically. Um, right. I think either I, way, it's important because maybe you can actually predict, oh, this child is is or is not likely to zero convert and maybe yeah, you change yeah. the vaccine regimen. But at the same time, um, I'm not sure that we have actually seen cause and effect here. Sorry, Kathy. <laughs> well, no, what I was just going to say, it seemed, you know, once this was pointed out, the stunning, wasting, and underweight, that if you're generally not healthy, you're probably not going to have the best immune response. Yeah. And so, therefore, you might not seroconvert when exposed to this vaccine. And yeah. also, these, these uh, malnutrition, stunting, wasting, underweight, these are all major problems throughout the low-income countries um, and would certainly be the places where you would see low efficacy of rotavirus vaccine. And all four of these conditions are treatable with a miracle drug called food, which, <laughs> yes, I mean, it seems like that might be a focus of intervention. And I know, of course, that people have tried that and pointed that out and it keeps not getting done. So now we're looking at viromes, but just something so to think you, about. The thing is, uh, Alan, that you could do a clinical trial, but you can have a control group. No, you, you couldn't have a control group that you don't You feed. can't withhold food. Right. Uh, or at least what you're improving on, it seemed that would be unethical, right? Right. Uh, just two things I wanted to bring up. Um, first, they say they have two hypotheses for what bacteriophages might do to influence, if in fact they do influence immunogenicity, right? They may interact with bacteria, right? The phages somehow change the bacteria. It's the bacteria that are doing the influencing. And we know that bacteria make various chemicals that can influence immune responses. So that's plausible. Or they may 
um, interact with the immune system independently. The phages may interact independently of the bacteria. They could increase cytokines, for example. Um, and ph they say phage expanded phages have been linked to inflammatory enteric diseases like Crohn's. So they could stimulate innate responses, which in turn could uh, modulate the ability of the vaccine to reproduce. So th I think those are interesting ideas. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and yeah. the same would go for the eukaryotic virum, right? Mm -hmm. Where they would be stimulating, say, innate responses that could inhibit the vaccine. But there are a lot of questions here, like the COSAVIRUS role, what are they doing? And just needs, we just need to be, have a better understanding of uh, their, their prevalence and what they're doing in the gut. And we certainly don't know that. But they do, in, they do offer some interesting uh, solutions. Because I'm thinking, what are you going to do? The microbiome, the phageome, you can't change it. And they said, well, first... We could give the vaccine earlier to kids when maybe there's much lower uh, numbers of phage and eukaryotic viruses to do the interfering. That would be like a low-tech solution, right? So they Not as low-tech as food, but yeah. Right. They mentioned, uh, <laughs> they mentioned neonates. So I guess that's right at birth. Because the, yeah. the first dose in this is six weeks. Yeah. Yes, yeah, in fact, there's been a trial. They say there's a trial in neonates, and you get better seroconversion than later. And so maybe that's it right there. Makes Just sense. Uh, or they said, um, okay, so these are orally administered vaccines, so why don't we inject them <laughs> and get around the gut interfering with them? Parenteral and non-oral vaccines. And they say there's a, uh, a vaccine, a subunit vaccine being tested, which... Uh, would be injected intramuscularly. So maybe that would get around the whole problem. That would be interesting too. But, uh, you know, injection introduces the other issue of needles and that yeah. sort of thing. So anyway. But, uh, you really uh, got my attention with this food thing. <laughs> food usually gets my attention too. Uh, so I'm, and I'm wondering how that could be f uh, folded into the rest of the study because if it's, if that's really, uh, the issue, I mean, well, a, 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 a uh, an analysis that we're missing is how does the microbiome vary? Yes, with these uh, issues of stunting, wasting, and under with malnutrition. Right. I mean, I would expect a correlation, as we've already discussed, but whether it correlates exactly with these uh, things that we have identified. Uh, that's missing. I don't know. I, I am pretty sure others have done the studies of microbiome correlations with malnutrition, but it's not the same analysis necessarily. Right. right yeah, that, that has been done. I'm actually looking here um, and I'm not finding um, exactly how they defined malnutrition um, because maybe, you know, they're using, I don't know how uh, similar or different uh, definitions might be on right. that. Uh, here, I have to read you one of the last sentences. In conclusion, young Ghanaian infants have rich and complex prokaryotic and eukaryotic viromes. I just picture, what's his name? Ricardo Montalban, rich, rich Corinthian leather. Rich complex, yes. <laughs> Do you guys remember that ad? Yes. Rich and complex prokaryotic and eukaryotic viromes. I hope everyone does, actually. They probably do. Okay. So uh, I want to uh, make another uh, two two more comments. First of all, the graphical as, uh, abstract on this is really good. Yes, uh, it does a really good job of summarizing this. Second, I just want to comment generally on um, international collaborations to solve to address problems like this, because this is uh, this is a collaboration between some U.S. labs and some. Uh, facilities uh, in Africa, uh, and it's and the stuff, Netherlands uh, and the Netherlands, funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, several uh, research initiatives uh, from the U.S. and etc. Um, uh, I just think this is the kind of stuff that we really need. Yes, uh, a global perspective and global. Uh, not that it's lacking. Okay. Um, but I just wanted to highlight that, that the, uh, it's important for 
high income countries to contribute to global health by studying problems that are problems that aren't necessarily immediate problems for them. Right. And, and it's also I'm, important for those scientists to collaborate with scientists from other countries um, and not just do it all themselves. There well, are some awesome yes. scientists yeah. in uh, all over the world. And it's not like we need to, you know, pop in, do some work, get a paper and leave. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, got, and you'll I've also, got, besides the just the the equity issues associated with that, you'll also get much better results faster if you're working with people who are there and who know what the heck is going on. So, uh, yeah, I got a pick coming up uh, probably in the new year sometime that addresses a little more of this. And in the back of my mind, of course, as I'm talking about this, I'm talking about what uh, I'm thinking about what to me is the catastrophe of the sort of dismemberment of our global collaboration with the Chinese on uh, trying to identify sources of uh, uh, spillover uh, for uh, potential pandemics, yeah. including an administrative uh, um, uh, torching of a grant that was funding that mm -hmm. sort of collaboration. Yep. Yeah. So, Yep. Absolutely. We let's, know who started let's that. Do, let's do good. Uh, Vincent, back to the paper when you were mentioning how they solved the problem. I was looking at something else and I might not have heard. Did you talk about the fact that they talked about you could give the vaccine a different way? Not yeah, right. Like or I, I am, okay. for example. Yeah, yeah. right. And there's okay. one, there's a subunit vaccine given that way, which is in trial, which if it works, that could be used. Maybe that'll solve the problem. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. It's interesting. Yeah. You know, we think that these orally administered vaccines are great, which, and they can be, but, you know, even the oral polio vaccines had trouble in India. They had to give many doses for them to work, and maybe similar me interference mechanisms were at play. But I think in India, if, correct me, Alan, if I'm wrong, but in some cases they had to give up the 10 doses of OPV to yeah, get proper and, protection. And, well, there were a couple of things going on there. One was that they were doing it through these national immunization days instead of through the usual pediatric schedule that we do in yeah. developed countries or rich countries or whatever we're calling them now. Uh, uh, higher income. Uh, higher income countries, sorry. Um, and uh, and that was not practical in in places with less infrastructure. And so they did these national immunization days where everybody who's in the age group just gets their polio vaccine that day. Mm. Um, and that may have had something to do with it, but I suspect the deeper issue was something like this, was uh, um, yeah. gut microbiome. Because again, you're putting a live virus into the gut and you're expecting it to do certain things and that's going to happen differently in different guts. And maybe not as well yeah. in guts that aren't as well nourished. So no one's tried improving in a cohort of 100 kids, for example. Give them different food and or better well, you can solve meals. malnutrition. Yeah, that's totally solvable. Um, but the problem is that it's not a sexy issue that draws the grant money and keeps it sustained for years and years that are necessary to solve that problem. That's one of those where we know how to fix the problem. We just can't. Seems to me if you had a mouse model where you undernourished them and you did vaccine responses and showed they were poor and then in a control group, proper nourishment, chow, mouse chow. That would be an experiment <laughs> to do if somebody hasn't already done it, yeah. And and it's I, I can't imagine that it hasn't been done, right? I mean, that delicious mouse chow, mouse right? Chow. Those pellets. Yes. <laughs> Our second uh, paper today is in <laughs> Signal Transduction and Targeted Therapy, a Nature Journal. You think there are a lot of yogurts? <laughs> you haven't seen the Nature <laughs> Journals. Yes. Nature and El Sevier, oh my. Uh, infection of wild-type mice by SARS-CoV-2, B.1.351 variant, indicates a possible novel cross-species transmission route. And this comes from... Sun Yat-sen University Center for Guangdong Center for Disease Control and Prevention and the National Guangzhou Laboratory. All right, so someone told me the other day it's Gu it's Guangzhou. Guangzhou, okay? yes. 
So I was pronouncing it wrong. Oh, how are you pronouncing it? Guangzhou. Oh, no, it's Guangzhou. Okay. Guangzhou. Yeah. And I believe you because you were there for I a while. I was there, yes. This guy who was telling me this is from Australia. I said, what would an Australian know about it? He said, well, I lived there for years. Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's, an, it's um, a neat the, town. It's a very old, very old city and a lot of, a lot of history. Isn't that where SARS-1 began? I think that's about right, yeah. In the Guangdong province, right? Yeah. yeah. The Guangdong province has Guangzhou and Shenzhen, and Shenzhen is where your iPhone probably came from. It's the you, you didn't visit there, did you? I did not get to Shenzhen. Um, okay. No, we were we were busy with other errands. Yeah, well, if you order something from Apple, you get a, a notice from Shenzhen, Shenzhen that it's coming. Yeah. The, I the like that when the, the world is compressed industry. like that. I kind of like it. Yeah. All right, anyway, so, the... Go ahead. Sorry. I, I just wanted to give the, the overview um, yeah. because it really is described in the title, but you might not have really listened to the title because we went on to other things. But infection of wild type mice by a particular variant, which we now know as the beta variant, yes. indicates a possible novel cross species transmission route. So we're going to talk here about infecting wild type mice with a variant, a naturally occurring variant nothing that's been modified in the lab to make it able to infect mice. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so and neither they, modified they, mice nor not modified virus. Right, and the context for this, of course, is that if you take original OG SARS-CoV-2 or, um, or alpha, uh, I guess maybe even, um, then you cannot just infect your laboratory mice with it. So people modify the mice or they modify the virus and do their models that way because we love to have a mouse model. It's a nice thing to use. Um, and so these folks looked at beta. Oh, gee, is original gangster, yes. isn't it? Yes. Yeah, well, what does that mean in terms of viruses? <laughs> <laughs> I probably original just, gangster virus. Yes. Probably misapplied, but. It's fine with me. I don't care. Anyway, three, four first authors, Ting Pan, Ran Chen, Xin He, or He, Yao Chang Wan, and... Two corresponding authors, Shan Kai Ma and Hui Zhang. My, my apologies for the uh, mispronunciations. At least you got um, Guangzhou right now. <laughs> now I got Guangzhou. Joe, it's easy to remember. Joe. Joe. So as uh, variants of SARS-CoV-2 have arisen um, with various changes in Spike and elsewhere, uh, there have been um, discussions, and in fact, some preprints have already come out saying that these, some of these changes may uh, enable uh, the virus to reproduce in non-human uh, animals. Um, they, they do a nice summary of this in their introduction. So the original OG SARS-CoV-2 <laughs> <laughs> could infect cats, dogs, lions, tigers, and mink. Oh my. And experimentally in the lab, monkeys, hamsters, ferrets, and tree shoes. And of but course, not, as we've talked about on TWIV, it's also found now in North American deer. Deer. Oh, that's another guest I'm working on for January. You're going to have a it's deer a, on? A deer. We're <laughs> going to have a deer hanging on a fence. No, no. That uh, uh, There's a lab at Penn State that has been involved in uh, looking at that outbreak, and he's going to come on and talk about oh, it. It's very excellent. interesting. Penn State is very well placed for looking at deer. The, the samples came from Iowa. Uh, um, okay. It was a collaboration I mean, beautiful. I mean, lots of serology and sequencing, and they could identify six independent spillovers because there was, the sequences were different from humans to deer. So, oh wow, this is—I don't know where this contact is happening. Game farms, game farms. That's my money's on game farms. That would you be mean, the same. Have, that would be the same sort of thing as mink farms. Yes. Yeah, there are there are these facilities scattered around the country where they raise deer. Um, and you know, that's for food. Uh, yeah. For, but then how so, does it go from the game farm to the deer population? Escapes. Oh, they get out really? Sure. I want to get out of here. And also, also <laughs> wild deer, um, you know, just kind of coming up uh. to the fence of the, the game farm. Cause Hey, there are deer in there and there's food. That's a good idea. I didn't think of, I didn't know there were deer farms. Yeah. There are, um, so there are, uh, this is not widely publicized because there's sort of a dark corner of the hunting industry where people can um, pick out which deer they'd like to hunt 
and then they I go see. to an enclosure and shoot that deer and they get the trophy <gasps> for their wall. Oh, come on. Seriously? Yes, seriously. This exists. Yes. Yeah, they they also <laughs> exist for um all sorts children, of ex- exotic children game. to see. Um there is one near where I grew up. Oh my gosh. It's like releasing rabbits in Australia for hunting purposes. Yeah. Oh, anyway, um that's a that's a plausible solution. I like that. So anyway, we'll uh talk he has a lot of ideas about how this happens. So so, so part of the relevance of this is you know, what other hosts might there be yeah. for SARS-CoV-2 yep. out there? And to what extent can uh, humans and these other hosts exchange viruses back and forth? Yeah. The, the, the big overarching period picture yeah. being, is there an animal reservoir for SARS-CoV-2? <laughs> and how does that play into this and future pandemics? And there sure is I, an animal I, reservoir for it now. Yes. Yeah, humans. Well, well, there's humans, and, there's deer and, and deer and mice. And, yeah. Certainly remember... Um, Cats and mink uh, and... Deer mice. Yeah. Yeah, Tony Shounce. Tony Shounce. And I don't know if you've seen the preprint just came out, the, the comparisons of Omicron sequences with human and mouse isolates and the thing clusters with mouse cura- SARS-CoV-2-like viruses. So this is, the implication is it may have... I don't know. We get, you have to really do some experiments to find out, but that could be a problem, right? Yeah. So anyway, this, uh, w- w- so the original SARS-CoV-2 did not infect wild mice, uh, mus musculus, uh, because the spike doesn't bind uh, mouse ACE2. But you could get around that if you wanted an animal model by putting human ACE2 into mice as a transgene, and then you can infect them with the uh, OG SARS-CoV-2. Sorry, Alex. Just, <laughs> That's <yeah>. permanent <laughs> now. For, yeah. and, um, and we also did a paper out of the Barrick Lab early on where they passaged SARS-CoV-2 in mice and eventually selected for a variant that could bind um, mouse ACE2, and that, that can be used as uh, a mouse model. And th- there are one or two amino acid changes in that variant, and they match what then subsequently arose in variants of concern. Uh, so um, it's, it's quite interesting. And you'll see that come back here. But one of the, the limitations is that in all of those models, the mice don't get very sick. They, they don't die pretty much and they lose weight, but they recover. And, you know, as you know, in humans, there's a serious part of COVID that is simply not mimicked in any of these uh, animal models. So they're wondering, well, if, any of these variants can affect mice. Would that help? I mean, it's an instructive, as we'll go through it, it's instructive, but I don't think it helps in the end with serious disease, as far as I can tell. I couldn't find anywhere if any of the mouse died in this experiment, but maybe, maybe that. Which uh, <laughs> we'll get to this, but it's a little surprising given, given yeah. what their lungs look like. Yeah. Yeah. And this does, however, help address the question of reservoirs. Um, so now we've got it in deer, we've got it in potentially cats and other peri-domestic animals. Um, and here, uh, I mean, basically they they find you can infect mice with beta, uh, with the beta variant. So yeah. mice are all around humans all the time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Th- this also are. helps with the ability to do some of the experiments that somebody might want to do yes. because this is sort of a more authentic mouse model. Yeah, and even if you don't recapitulate the pathogenic process, you do get the, the basic virology it, if it infects. You know, the, <clears throat> the question is, which variant do you want to do experiments with, right? Yeah. Because they all are slightly different in different ways, most likely that... Uh, and, right, but... Know, if it, I'm not sure what what's the global situation with beta. Is it Hasn't it been outcompeted? <laughs> well, at least in their case, I think it's the one that they had yeah. at the time, as a virus. yeah. Well, they uh, think in, in in the end for doing yeah. these experiments, yeah, it's the there there are several that could be candidates for doing ultimately the mouse experiments. But this is the one where they actually had live virus. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's worth comparing all of them in mice sure. to see it, what differences you have and what they if they correlate with certain changes and so forth. That that has to be done. And you want to do that if you can do that with virus and mice that's great because if you're adapting or using transgenes then it's always an artificial situation so so they they first they they had spikes of all the variants um starting with 
D614, G614 through all of them up to Delta. And they put the spikes uh, into pseudotypes, um, pseudotype viruses. And these pseudotypes are lentiviruses. lentiviruses so they're based yeah. on a retrovirus as opposed to the pseudotypes that we talked about before that were vesicular stomatitis virus based. Yeah. And they, the pseudotype viruses have a, a gene encoding luciferase, which they can easily measure as a proxy for what they call infectivity. Uh, so you could put spikes, different spikes in all these different pseudotypes and infect cells and say, which makes more light, <laughs> right? Um, you put the same amount of pseudotype in, which is brighter. And unfortunately, these are, <laughs> heck, 293T cells, which, um, you know, what, human embryonic kidney, right? Right. Yeah, not even really kidney. They're cells. <laughs> They're just cells. They're just cells. <laughs> <laughs> And the relevance to biology is not clear. And um, I, I suppose what you're really doing is simply isolating the f initial step in, infect in infection yeah. and everything else is the same. And you say, that, is that initial step different in the spike ACE2 interaction? Yeah. And the, you can see the, they have a lovely figure showing this where they normalize infectivity versus the individual spikes. And you can see that uh, some of them are better than others, right? It looks like deltas are doing very well here. Um, well, delta does okay in the human cells. You're looking at figure 1B? Or? Yeah, sorry, I'm looking at human yeah. cells. Yeah, If you look yeah. at mouse cells, then uh, 1.351 is doing much better, yeah. Yeah, and a, well, one of the, one of yeah. the things reading with this paper is that they're using the old designations of the variant. So it's 1.351 and uh, 617, yeah. and, and we're trying to convert on the fly to um, alpha, beta, gamma, et cetera. Right. And so the, the point one is kappa, and the point yeah. two is delta. And it's actually, they're human cells, but they have either the human ace or the mouse ace, too. Yeah. So for the mouse ace, four of the variants did better. And B1.351 did the best in terms of making light after infecting cells with pseudotypes. And that's beta. And that is beta, right? Um, so they say, okay, maybe uh, this virus could infect mice. So let's explore this. So then they do surface plasmon resident experiments, SPRs, to measure the binding of spike with ACE2, mouse ACE2, or human ACE2 in a microfluidics device where you can quantify uh, affinities very nicely. And I think we've talked about this not too long ago and even right. have an email, right? <laughs> right. Mark Daniels sent me um, a manual, uh, a PDF of the application guide. And I don't know how to attach it in the show notes, but he sent it to Vincent as well. It's really nice, uh, lengthy document about how to interpret SPR. So... Our listeners come through. <laughs> it's a it's a extremely quantitative, precise way to measure affinities uh, between ligands and receptors. Very very good, um, and they, they find all the variant spikes have high affinities to human ACE two. The the six one four variants had no binding to mouse ACE two. Um, others had high binding affinities, um, uh, and one dot three five one. And P1 were higher than 117 and Delta. Um, and they also found that Delta and Lambda have no spikes, have no binding to mouse ACE2 at all. It's interesting. Right. So it was beta and gamma that were the better binding to mouse spike. Right. Mouse ACE2, I mean. Yeah. All right. So you have changes in these spikes that enable a higher affinity binding to mouse ACE2. So... Then what do you do next? Well, you uh, see if they can infect mice. I wonder if they didn't do mouse cells in culture. It might be something you would do before mice, no? Maybe. I'm wondering what mouse cells you would use. I well, don't know there's really a mouse equivalent to hex. Well, no, there are plenty of mouse cell lines that you could right. use for sure. And um, you just have to make sure they have ACE2, right? I don't know. I would have done it first before mice because it's cheap if you have yeah. them growing. Anyway, so we go right into mice. Uh, uh, I'm just uh, uh, back up a second. I'm looking yeah, at these yeah. numbers, and 
So maybe you already said this because I've been. Uh, it's okay. I've been distracted. Uh, You're thinking with about Kathy's food, question. right? No, I'm thinking about beta, <laughs> and you know where 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 it was, where it went, et cetera. At any rate, so uh, these variants, if I'm reading the SPR data correctly, all have. Um, higher affinity, well, maybe, for the human receptor. I'm wondering why. Why uh, are, I mean, I assume that with these variants, uh, maybe this is even a, an unwarranted assumption, uh, but I assume that there's selection going on that makes these things uh, arise. Maybe. Okay? Maybe. And I'm wondering you know, w w uh, is it just coincidence that these things uh, uh, bind the mouse receptor better? Uh, what's the selection? Okay, and so I'm looking at the numbers for the human receptor, and some of them at least bind better to the, the, to the human receptor. And I think all of them might do well. I don't know, if you use the D614G as your baseline, that's actually one of the, well... One of six fifteen is, is KD. Well, it's I almost don't know if you can five nanomoles. Yeah. Any rate, okay. So the, no, but it's a good question. I mean, I don't think these were selected in mice. I think exactly. They're, well, they're coincidental, do I. right? Uh, yeah. So they're either selected because they confer higher affinity and infectivity, maybe. But I think they're at the antigenic sites also, and that's probably what the original selection was. Yeah. That the RBDH two interface has also antigenic sites, and maybe that was the selection that. Just happened to improve right. uh, so, binding. Yeah, so, uh, who knows, right? Yeah. Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> I mean, you'll never know. You can do experiments in the lab and see that it affects antigenicity and binding, but who knows what the original selection was, right? Uh, the experiments on this are going to be going on for years. Well, Got a lot I, of, go ahead. I, I wonder how similar mouse ACE2 and, say, bat ACE2 are. Hmm. Um, and whether or not sort of the interface that binds to ACE2 is just an interface that's undergoing a lot of rapid change um, because it's sort of interacting with so many different species of ACE2. Somewhere back there, there's a TWIV episode that answers that question, I think. Because <laughs> yeah. I remember an episode yeah. where we looked at a whole bunch of different ACE2s. Yeah. ACE2s, yeah. Do you remember the, the isolates from Lao, the country Lao, Mm -hmm. They have the highest similarity to uh, in the RBD to um, SARS-CoV-2, especially in the contact residues, more so than any other virus. So there are lots of, yes, there are lots of variants out there, um, in, especially in the interface between that and the receptor. <clears throat> anyway, they infect mice intranasally, wild-type mice, 10,000, 10, 100,000, and a million focus-forming units. Of B.1.351. Beta. Beta. I like B.1.351. Because, <laughs> you know, I got Delta now because it arose in my lifetime and <laughs> in <your laughs> recent, recent memory and Omicron. I get those. But the earlier ones I got to know is their numbers, yeah. right? Uh, beta. B.1.351. B. So what was that dose again? As I recall, there's a lot of virus. Yeah. 10,000, 100,000, and a million. FFU. Okay. I'm glad they used the range. That was good. Yes. They also um, infected transgenic human ACE2 mice, right? So they use that as a positive control. Right. And then they pull out the lungs and look at RNA level by PCR. And so B1351 reproduces well and dose dependent in wild type mice, C57 black but no weight loss, and all the mice are alive on day seven, post-infection. Okay. Um, then they do, so the virus is reproducing in mice. What is the, uh, that's a supplementary figure. I'm not going to go look at it. Did you, did you look at the plaque assay in the supplementary I did. figures? It, they show the actual plaque assay. Yes, they do. Blue it, place yes. with plaques. It's what they call a focus forming uh, unit. Yeah. What are they using? Antibody or something to make? Yeah, antibody to N, I think. Okay. Okay, good. Uh, then they challenge uh, 
trans, ACE2 transgenics, BALB C and C57 black with 500,000 FFU of B1351. Again, uh, B1351 reproduce efficiently in lung and trachea in both BALB C and C57 black 6 besides the ACE2 transgenics. The RNA copies peak on day two. Um, and then they go through some other numbers, which we don't need to go under. Then they pull. So the virus is reproducing in wild type mice. ACE2, human ACE2 transgenics is the control. But all the mice survive. There's the answer to my question <laughs> originally. And then they pull out lung tissues and do staining to see what's happening at the cellular level. The mice didn't they survive see, that. They didn't survive that, but they probably would have. They have lung damage. They see a lot of uh, damage to the lung, cellular infiltrates, edema, collapse, alveoli. Um, they can find viral protein in the lung. They also find viral proteins in other tissues, but they say no infectious virus except in the lung and trachea. So not only did the mice survive, but it's, as I recall from the text at least, uh, they couldn't even measure any significant weight change. Yeah. Yes. Which is kind of the easy and, and go-to measurement for whether or not there's any uh, real uh, signs of uh, infection. In Look a, for in malnutrition. Yeah. yeah. Right. So <laughs> then they go on to measure cytokines uh, in these B1351 beta infected mice. And as you might guess, there are many cytokines that are upregulated. And I'm not going to tell you all about them, but they say, okay, look, we got significant lung injury. We got upregulation of many cytokines that also go up in humans. This mimics serious disease, serious COVID in humans. And I think that's a stretch because the mice don't die. I did, mean, did they actually say serious disease or did where I'm looking, they just say substantially mimics the infection. Yeah, I changed it. Sorry, I changed the word. <laughs> okay. Significant pathological lung lesions and inflammatory responses. And I would agree that they are significant. Yeah. Which substantially mimics infection and pathogenesis of, of COVID in humans. Well, yeah, it substantially I, I, mimics infection and pathogenesis of a lot of things in humans. Yes. Right? Now, I would say this is not severe COVID. No. Right? No. That's quite clear. So that's fine. But it's interesting that it reproduces in mice, and it makes sense because some of the changes that were present in uh, Barrick mouse adapted viruses is also present here. So it makes sense. Uh, and this is the first formal demonstration of that. So then they ask if the virus can be transmitted among mice. There is but something put, about transmission experiments that I really like. I don't know what it is. But they but, put the mice in the same cage. So yeah. they take some mice and they infect them. And then after a day, I think, is it a day? Two days. Uh, yeah. Two, two, days. two days. Then they put in some other oh, no. mice no, in the day. same cage. Yeah. One. One. Yeah. one. Day one. They put some mice together. And as you know, mice are, are very social. They interact with each other. They even fight. And so then seven days later, they sack the mice and they can find virus in, um, th well, you don't know who's the original and who's the introduced. Oh, no. they, I guess they mark them. They do. Yeah, they, they, do. Do. they, they must know have the marked infected them. mice and the recipient. Yeah, because yeah, so, they call them infection and transmission. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So they uh, find virus in some of them, but not all of them. Some of the ones that Inf they didn't give it to. This, the, uh, this frustrated me because they, they give numbers for viral load in the trachea or the lung, for example, yeah. and IgG, and it's an average number for the whole co cohort, all yeah. right? And I had to really kind of dig around uh, to figure out how many mice actually got virus. You can actually see it in the, in the bar charts, uh, kind of, uh, because you could, they, they show yeah, the, the individual thoughts, yeah. mice. Okay, uh, they don't give the numbers for the individual mice or make a determination on the individual mice as to who got it and who didn't. But what you can see is, you know, probably the uh, strongest evidence of transmission is vice in the, uh, I'm sorry, virus in the trachea. And there's, uh, what, th uh, three that are definitely mm -hmm. infected. Mm -hmm. And then there's another three that are down on the, uh, bottom, yeah, that may yeah, be a yeah. little different than each other. I don't know if they're infected or not. At any rate, yeah, uh, yeah. not all the mice got infected. 
Right. Okay. And, and the ones that did had very low levels. I mean, in the in the original inoculated mice, they had six logs of RNA copies, right? And mm -hmm. then the average in the contact mice between one and two logs, right? Yeah, that was so, the most striking part to me was how right much low. less those my, the and, mice who received it had. And I don't know if it's even – well, I guess they have an antibody response, although that's pretty weak, right? But they, maybe it also has to do with if you experimentally infect mice, you're giving a yeah, whole bunch of sure. virus, yeah. one, you know, into the, you know, intranasally, or I think that's how they did it. Yeah, yeah, And then right. if you're that's just right. catching it in a cage, eh. Could you get, be. get a lower yeah. inoculum, the immune response kicks in faster and it replicates to lower titers. <clears throat> Could yeah. be. Or you don't know necessarily about um, which day following infection you're looking at here. Yeah. So, right. so I are, think it's kind of not robust. So what did we find up here that uh, the actual virus load or RNA load in lung and trachea peaked at uh, day two? Yeah. So they yeah. could have at least waited another day. Well, I'm, okay. I suspect yeah. the contact transmission experiment was a reviewer three thing. <laughs> yeah. I, I think they probably got through the other stuff and then somebody said, well, why don't you see if they transmit? And uh, yeah, I don't know. Okay, I think they probably, uh, maybe they tried in separate cages originally. It didn't transmit, it didn't transmit right? right? Right. Well, so, but it looks like here they waited seven days after mm -hmm. putting them together. And so Rich points out that it, uh, oh. The virus peaks after a day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, you know, as to Kathy's point, you, you inoculate the mice, you get very high titers, at least an RNA copy number, right, in the lung. And that's what it takes to get to another mouse by contact. That's a lot. And I don't know, what was the inoculum? 10 to the 5 times 10 to the 5th? Was that what it was here? Let's see. Um, 5 yeah, times 10, 10 to the 6th. Ah, it's a lot of virus mm -hmm. to get contact yeah. transmission. So I don't know how this reflects what happens in people, but that suggests that you need quite a high RNA load to to be able to transmit. So, so now wait a minute. Let's get it. Let's let's get this straight here. I'm yeah. looking at the figure legend. Uh, Twelve mice were inoculated on day zero, assigned yeah. to two cages. On day one, six. Naive mice were assigned. That's right. Uh, mm -hmm. Into each cage, so they mix them up on day one. Day seven, and they uh, sampled them. They sampled half of half them. Half of them and, um, to look for virus, and right. then on day fourteen, they sampled the other half right. to look at antibodies. antibodies. Yeah, and although we know that they could tell them apart in this figure because. They're blue and white. <laughs> <laughs> they probably ear tagged yes. us yeah, so yeah, yeah, sure. that they knew which was. Yes. Well, I came away uh, from this thinking uh, the R naught's pretty low. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. The so mice are not I, having super spreader events. Uh, yeah, I don't think SARS CoV 2 is going to, um, uh, you know, start an epidemic in the Balbsi. Uh, mice that we have running around <laughs> outs well, outdoors. Do, I know mice have a lot of different um, physiology. Do they cough? Do they sneeze? I don't think they do, no. They don't cough or sneeze, but ferrets do. Right. Mm. So, well, but then also there's the possibility that just by talking, um, you you spread a lot of virus, yeah. but they don't talk, they don't talk. either. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but, so, but maybe by breathing, you know. So, but so I think not. I think in general, um, mice don't transmit well uh, through the air because of these considerations. But other animals do. Uh, guinea pigs can do it. So influenza transmission can do adjacent guinea pigs in cages, ferrets, and those are the ones you would go to for that. So I'm. I'm not sure how valuable this is for transmission studies. I, mean, I think the main point of this paper is that this B1351 can infect mice. Yeah, yeah. Do you, and, do you um, think somebody's now going to do this and take all the variants and infect ferrets? Would be well, to do what? Find out if they could transmit to, to or do the transmission studies? Yeah. Maybe. Yeah, the original the original uh, virus OG SARS-CoV-2 does infect ferrets and does transmit oh, to right. yeah. okay. ferrets in yeah. adjacent cages, and actually, it wouldn't add much. Molnupiravir will block that 
remember that paper we did. Um, so I, I think, um, I don't even know if at this level that uh, this would be fit in wild mice, right? I just don't know because they're sticking this right in the nose and the transmission is kind of inefficient. So I'm not sure it would make it in the wild. Yeah, I mean, to me, the the biggest use of this is um, in the fact that mice are genetically tractable. And so then you can sort of yeah. Yeah. use the different yeah. mice with different genetic backgrounds. Yeah, you don't have to use an adapted virus. You don't have to use the transgenic mouse. You could just use B1.351 if you wanted to study some aspect. But I think if you're worried about this, I'm not so worried about this establishing itself in, in my sub, although, of course, it could undergo other changes yeah. that might make it more yeah, fit. Yeah, I'm so. thinking it's what, what's been demonstrated here is it can infect mice, and all you have to do is repeat that a few times before you yeah, start maybe. selecting for a strain that is good at infecting mice. Um, and that was not done in this paper, but could be done in nature. Yeah. Or in an apartment building. So, Rich, they have, a, they have a, a sentence here. It remains to be clarified if the extension of host range and immune evasion is coincidence or coevolution. Yeah. That's okay. what you were asking yeah. before, right? right? Yeah. Anyway, that's all I have to say about that. Um, I really want to see more wildlife sampling of yeah. rodents of all kinds and seeing what's in them, which variants are they. Because in the deer, they're really ripping through the deer population very rapidly. Yeah. Um, and the deer seem to be okay. They don't seem to be getting sick. Yeah, it's interesting to think that, you know, even in terms of uh, this spillover or potential spillover, we, uh, we could generally be barking up the wrong tree. There's lots of species out there that we haven't looked at. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking about MERS and how long we clung to the idea that it came from bats when it was just the camels were loaded with it. <laughs> yeah. <Right. laughs> yep, they are loaded with it. I just, I have a feeling this is going into a lot of mammals in the yeah. wild. Uh -huh. Yeah. And um, we're going to find out about it. Yeah. And that's potentially an issue, right? Because you're not going to be able to reduce um, contact with people and so forth. So. Well, maybe and maybe another significance of this paper and other similar papers that we've already alluded to in this discussion is that there is some sort of either some sort of coevolution or coincidental evolution of uh, ACE2 binding yeah. that goes along with the evolution of these viruses that uh, could potentially impact on the host range. So the ability to infect rodents is probably a coincidence of the changes and maybe it is because there's a small interface between ACE2 and RBD that there's not a lot of things you can do and a change in humans then affects another species. Yeah, right. Right? And I, I think for, I've, I'm still occasionally hearing people talking about eradicating SARS-CoV-2 <laughs> and, and I just, I, then you, I see a paper like this where, you know, they've, in, in the introduction, they're citing nine papers that are about other species that can be infected. And yeah, just, yeah. no, this is never, ever going away. This is, getting, this is getting to be like the, well, pending what we find in the wild, the influenza situation where the virus is yeah. in many, many birds, uh, water birds and so forth and pigs. And there's no way you can eradicate it. Yeah. So like, where did Omicron come from? All of a sudden. You know, all of these so, mutations, you know? I, I don't know. That's a great question. Um, some people think it came from uh, rodents, but, uh, you know, there's no proof of could that. Have been, could have been one immunocompromised human who, or it could have could been have one been. Immu immunocompromised rodent. I, I don't know. <laughs> there it is sure another. It, it sure smells like it's been selected in some immune population. Yes, well, actually, for any of the variants, we don't know where they yeah. originated, right? right? But well, uh, I mean, Omicron's branch is just so divergent from the other ones was, on the phylogenetic tree. Then there's another branch now of Omicron, which is less diverse, right? So where did that come from? Is that ancestral, parallel? Who knows? Um, yeah, we need to do more wild. We need more wildlife sampling, right, Rich? <laughs> Yeah. Remember our Galveston yeah, trip? Those that's right. old guys More were complaining. Nobody, nobody wants to do wildlife sampling anymore. 
It's what we need. Okay, let us go to our picks of the week. Brianne, what do you have for us? Um, I have uh, an XKCD comic, both today's and one that is related, um, that came out uh, a little earlier um, on immune responses. Uh, so the first one is the older one about the immune response, um, where we see two people talking and someone sort of saying, oh, I, I feel bad for my immune system, um, that it's it's freaking out about this vaccine. And then the other person telling them, no, it should freak out. You you want them, you want your immune system to think this is the worst thing that ever happened to it. Um, and so the person is saying some, some funny things to inspire yes. uh, their immune system, um, which I think sounds great. And then the other one, which is today's, um, is are two people arguing um, one arguing that it's better to be infected um, to get immunity. And then the discussion going on about how, well, the point is that you get infected to get immunity to protect you from getting infected and, and the problem with right. that logic and the text that you get, <laughs> if you hover over that one um, is pretty good too. Yes. Excellent. Kathy, what do you have for us? I picked an astrophotograph of the University of Virginia Rotunda. And uh, you'll see there's kind of a theme today with some space things. And this one includes the Heart and Soul Nebula, uh, the two uh, nebulae. Um, and it's a photograph of the probably most photographed uh, thing in the uh, that part of the country, uh, the, the University of Virginia Rotunda. And then how this was put together in this article um, from a number of images that the person planned. And then at the, and I wasn't aware of this, these two nebulae, which one of them really does look like a heart. It's very pretty. Um, uh, at the very bottom of the article, you can go to Brennan Gilmore's website, and then he's got a lot of really fabulous other astro photographs that he's taken that are worth. Uh, looking at as well. So um, anyway, very check nice, it out. very cool. That's yeah. really cool. I'd never heard of astrophotography before, but now I really like it. <laughs> yeah, and some of these are available as prints. Um, but he's got wow. yeah, lots. So of what is this? So you need to take lots of photos to get this kind of an image. You don't just look up and see this. Yeah, it's right? a composite. Right, right. Hmm. Mm -hmm. It's too dim. To see, uh, yeah, I think once. it's got to be really dark to see the Milky Way, right? And so yeah. the same, the the same light conditions where you can see the Milky Way are going to be different than the light conditions where you can see this sunset or a campfire, right? Yeah. So it's got to right. be a composite. And he needed oh. a he needed an image of the <laughs> rotunda with its lights on, which of course would have washed <laughs> out all of the other stuff. And so right. then he needed the dark photos as well. So he put that. He put that rotunda photo on separately. So yeah, it's it's all composited, and he used a, a statue of Homer uh, to help him line up the ah, photo. At first, I see. At first, he was it was frustrated because Homer was going to be kind of in the way, and then he was able to use it to prop it out. I see. Um, Wow, I'm, the article says 124 images put together. Yeah, there. yeah, you got to really so want to cool. do this. Yeah. So he would go out every night for four hours and do this, right? I'm not sure how many times he had to do that, but yeah. He said, so, yeah, 124 photos. I think it was over three uh, days. Four hours of exposure. Over three days? Okay. Yeah. Do you think he went, set up his thing every night or went, yeah, just left it there? Yeah. And just used Homer to line up the images. Yeah. Wow. That's probably yeah. a lot less boring than a bunch of PCRs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's got a nice <laughs> telescope camera yeah, thingy there. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. A lot of equipment and a nice cinder block to keep it all on. That's right. cool. <laughs> yeah, that's neat. <laughs> Rich, what do you have for us? So uh, uh, sometime, we've had a couple, of, we've had discussion previously of the James Webb Space Telescope. And uh, Dixon picked this about 300 episodes ago, which actually wasn't that long ago. <laughs> oh, no, right. Um. Uh, but this thing is going to be, I thought that this was going to be launched um, uh, after this episode dropped. But now that I know this isn't going to drop until Sunday, hopefully you're listening to this and um, understanding that the launch was successful. But there's still a lot to go on. These are 
two descriptions of what the whole process is about. Okay. Uh, there are two videos, one called 29 days on the edge, another called launch and deployment. The second one is an animation of what happens. Cause I was looking into this and, uh, wondering, uh, what's involved. And both of these, uh, in the process of each video, they're, uh, slightly different, uh, show you everything that has to happen, uh, for this thing to be deployed. Cause it's, it's basically a huge, telescope, which is a bunch of mirrors, uh, primary mirrors and a, and a secondary mirror, like you can imagine on a, a telescope that sits on top of uh, a very elaborate heat shield that points towards the sun. And they're shooting it out to Lagrange point two, which is a million miles from earth beyond the moon, where it's in essentially a stable uh, configuration and will uh, you know, orbit the sun kind of along with the earth. All right. Uh, but there's like hundreds of motors and hinges and things because you got to fold all this thing up and stick it in a rocket and then shoot it <laughs> off uh, and then have it all unfold correctly. And these, there's five layers of this heat shield that are the thickness of a human hair or less then all of this stuff has to be unfolded uh, and deployed without damaging it. And there's a whole bunch of different, there's like hundreds of different things, all of which are what do they call single point failure. Yeah. Any one of which, if it fails, the mission is toast. Yeah. And to get out there and fully deploy the thing, it's going to take a month. All right. This is really an ambitious project that they've been working on for 25 years. All right. Yeah. So these videos explain it quite well, and I really enjoyed them. Yeah, I watched the first one so far, and yeah, it's going to be a nail biting yes. time for what is for a month. Nail biting. What is yes. the uh, what yeah. is the likelihood that it will succeed? Do you have? They must have calculated it. Well, you know, <laughs> never tell uh, me the odds. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would. I'm going to guess really high. Because these guys are really good at this stuff, and there's they've got so much um, uh, invested in this, so much time, so much money that it just can't fail. Can you imagine how many tests they've done to make sure yeah. that this works right? A lot of the cost and complexity of something like this is the testing process, and that's what they've been doing, and that, and that's why the launch got delayed till what is it Christmas Eve now? They're gonna Christmas Eve. this thing up, but yep. because oh wait. No, we got to check that again, you know, and it, and just, well, you know, it's not good enough until we know that it's <laughs> going to work every time. So what you're saying is we could make cars that never break. Oh, how, much do you, how much do you want it to cost? <laughs> well, they, they want you to buy a new one. All yeah, the, exactly. We years, could right? make cars that never break, but it would be or very anything, expensive. Or any yeah. item. We could make a, an iPhone that doesn't battery die every four years, right? <laughs> Well, you can make an uh, iPhone with a replaceable battery and solve that problem. <laughs> yeah. This is amazing. I can't imagine how you would even decide you would do this if it's so likely to fail, unless your engineering is so great that... Yeah, but the payoff for to... this is going to be... Oh, so that's what I was going to ask. Yeah. What's, what are we going to see when this is functional? We're going to see everything. steroids. We're going to see everything. Hubble on steroids. Look back to the Big Bang. I mean, this thing will be able to see extremely far back in time, which is how that works. That's because it's away from the light yeah. contamination of the Earth? Yeah. Well, and part. it's away from the light contamination of and the atmosphere. So it's not and, looking through mm -hmm. the atmosphere. It's just looking straight out into no, space. And a million miles away is enough to do that, right? Sure. The other thing um, yeah. is uh, it's the spectrum is infrared that they're yeah. using, right. which has some, I don't fully understand it, but that has an impact on the quality uh, and of the images and what you actually mm -hmm. see. So uh, to, to the rockets, the thing is going out there, I don't know, 17,000 miles an hour, right? Even faster. It's getting to the moon twice as fast as the astronauts Okay. Did. Then how does it stop? Is a rocket that blows uh, and it yeah, stops? Yeah, it has, it has um, well, interestingly, uh, the, the fairing comes off this thing and it drops away from the primary propulsion very early in this mission, like 30 or 45 minutes or something like that. Uh, and the rest of it is 
uh, propulsion that's in that's built in to the telescope itself. And I didn't ask that uh, quite that question, Vincent, but I imagine uh, that part of it, at least, uh, is part of it is Newton, I'm sure, and part of it is uh, uh, little thrusters on the yeah. telescope itself. Yeah, they must because it'll just keep going if you don't. Right. Because there's no friction anymore, and right. It's worth looking up animations wow. of the orbit as well. I forget whether they're included in this uh, because it doesn't just actually sit at the Lagrange point. It orbits mm -hmm. around it. Okay. <laughs> okay. So it's a sort That's of cool. a Watusi orbit. <laughs> <laughs> How big is this orbit? What's the diameter? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Oh, you said it's like thousands of miles or Probably, a mile? Or, yeah. I'm guessing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they've got to keep it. They've got to keep it pointed with a heat shield toward the sun at all times, too. So it's mm -hmm. got a complicated dance. To so do. then it takes pictures and they they're sent back to Earth. How long yeah. does it take for the picture to get to Earth? Do you know? I don't a million know. miles. A million miles at the speed of light. Like twenty minutes or something. <clears throat> I don't know. Well, yeah. Well, Probably you know, what was long. the delay to the moon? Like four minutes? Was it that mm, long? It sounds Maybe it right. Wasn't that long. Nah, it can't be because it's uh, it's like uh, nine minutes to the sun. Yeah. I don't know the answer to your question. I'd have to do the calculation. There's 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 if there's any astronomers out there, they are really furious. Right. Now. <laughs> <laughs> it's a propagation time. At us. The propagation time to the moon is. Two and a half seconds. Okay. So that's going to be quick yeah. because this is only four times the distance to the moon. Moon is 250,000 miles, okay. as I recall, and this is a million So it'd be like eight, remember, 10 seconds. Yeah. Remember when we spoke with Kate on the um, ISS, yes. there was just a slight delay. But yeah. it's, in speech, it's enough to throw things oh, off, yeah. right? <laughs> I think that, and I think that that delay had as much to do with the processing as anything else. Yeah, yeah, probably, right. yeah. And it's going to be expensive because of roaming charges, too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Alan, what do you have for us? I have, um, I have a, a video game. Um, but, uh, but wait, it's not. <laughs> uh, for everybody, oh, no, I don't play video games. This is a puzzle game based on chemistry. It's called hmm. Sokobond. Um, it's derived from a whole subgenre of games called Sokoban games, which are sort of slide puzzle-like. Um, so you're moving things around. But what you're moving around are um, little pictures of molecules and atoms, and they have the correct number of available electrons to pair. And so you might have a level where you're looking at uh, two hydrogens uh, and an oxygen, and you have to move them around on this square grid in get them bound into water. Uh, well, that was simple enough. Now we're going to make ammonia, but one of your hydrogens is stuck up in a little pocket and you've got to get things attached in the right order. Um, and then, of course, you start introducing molecules like carbon that could form a double bond or a single bond or a triple bond. And, and it'll do any of those if you get it into the wrong position and then it won't undo those bonds because, of course, it wouldn't. Um, so it's, it's a chemistry puzzle game and it's just brilliantly done and beautifully illustrated. It's available on uh, on PC, a few different PC platforms, Steam and Itch and the Epic Store. It's on the Nintendo Switch, and they're supposed to release a mobile version of it for um, iOS and, and Android in 2022. And I, I highly recommend it. This thing's totally addictive. I will be downloading that uh, yeah. in the next 24 hours or so. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sounds like you can learn something from it yes. too, right? Yeah, and it has, when you put a molecule together, it'll come up with a little trivia about that molecule. And some of them are quite interesting. Cool, very nice. So my pick is a third space pick for yeah. today. It's uh, interesting. So my is a, um, so back in um, November, uh, SpaceX uh, circled the International Space Station 360 degree fly around, which had not been done since 2011, apparently. Uh, and they were doing this to test navigation sensors, but they took pictures. And we get now pictures of the ISS that I haven't been seen in ages. And they really give you a sense of the, the size of this thing and all the compartments and the panels and other stuff hanging off. 
So NASA published these. I'm going to link to a, an article at space.com because they have all the pictures in one place. Um, but you could also go over to the uh, to the NASA site. It's just, I mean, they're crystal clear, right? Very cool. Beautiful. Yeah, they are nice. Yeah. I mean, you know, you imagine people crawling through all these <laughs> yeah. tubes and... Well, not crawling, floating. Floating through <laughs> yeah. them in a most grabbing peculiar onto way. things. So that's where we interviewed Kate and uh, Kate Rubens and all these panels hanging off. I mean... It's just up there. It's all good. It's amazing. <laughs> so this is pretty cool pictures. I really like this. Excellent. Mm-hmm. I really like that. Awesome. Uh, speaking yeah. of space, uh, for those sci-fi geeks out there, I discovered from my son this weekend that the last book of the Expanse series has actually been published. And so I immediately bought it and I'm reading it. Very good. Uh, that is TWIV 846. You can find the show notes at microbe.tv slash TWIV. You can send us your questions and comments, TWIV at microbe.tv. And don't forget, if you want to support our work, you can donate to parasiteswithoutborders.com. It'll be matched and given to Microbe TV. And if you've donated through Patreon or PayPal to Microbe TV, uh, your donations for 2021 are... U.S. federal tax deductible. We are a 501c3. We thank everybody for your support. It's really appreciated. Rich Conda is an emeritus professor, University of Florida, Gainesville. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough. Always a good time. Get vaccinated. Kathy Spindler, University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks. This is a lot of fun. Alan Dove is at alandove.com. Alan Dove on Twitter. Thanks, Alan. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. And Brianne Barker's at Drew University, Bioprof Barker on Twitter. Thanks, Brianne. Thanks. It was great to be here. I wish all you guys a great holiday. You too. The uh, next uh, TWIV yeah, will you be too. next week. Yep. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>